Hey, Erev Tov! Wild Branch family, friends. Just wanted to uh, say good evening. Uh, we're going to continue our counting of the Omer. And in this counting, I actually, yesterday I wasn't feeling well, so I wasn't able to do a Facebook Live. My stomach was really bothering me. I'm feeling a little bit better today, but I just want to catch up. Uh, and if you're following the differences that we've... Uh, hey, there's Jake. Good evening, Jake. So yesterday... Uh, we're going to do yesterday's counting of the Omer, which is day uh, week two, day one. So um, now there's a there's a subtle difference and a nuance. So we have the Rabbinite tradition, which is after the basically copying the Pharisaical tradition, and then we have the Karaite tradition, which goes back to the first temple period, Karaite. The Karaites count the Omer based on the first sabbath the day after the day of the uh passover the, excuse me let me say that again it's a little bit confusing so passover they count the beginning of the counting of the omer for the it's the it's the eighth day after the the passover so there's passover there's the sabbath after that and then the eighth day so it's on so which was yesterday in the actual karaite counting of the omer now, there's some uh, scholars that believe that the rabbinic tradition changed in, in effort to combat those Christian believers who were Jews who became believers in Yeshua, and they wanted to offset it. So I can go into some of that history later. I'll get some research, and I'll actually do a more in-depth teaching on the uh, rabbinite traditions and where they came from. But suffice it to say, the Karaite tradition and many Messianic believers who want to copy exactly what the scriptures say, the counting of the Omer actually began yesterday, uh, which was Sunday, um, Easter Sunday, or the first fruits, uh, the Hapikorim in Hebrew. And so so today I'm going to go, so if you want to start with the Karaites, go back to day one, and then just go through each day. And uh, so today <clears throat> we're going to do uh, week two, day one. And now from using the rabbinical tradition where they're using the Sifarat, Ha'omer, the seven Sifarot. Uh, Sifarot means the emanations of God. And this is a mystical understanding. It actually comes from the uh, Kabbalah. Now, there's a whole other teaching I want to do on the Kabbalah or Kabbalah. And it's been how you pronounce it. And where it comes from and where it goes and what God speaks to us through some of these mystical writings, and then some of it goes too far and becomes occultic. And that, again, will be another teaching and another story. So, today is chesed, <coughs> chesed of Gevurah. Chesed is loving kindness. Remember, chesed means the flow. It's an actual Hebrew word. Chesed is the loving kindness. We have the Hasidic Jews, which is a sect of Judaism, and that's where they take their name from, is the word chesed loving kindness they pursue god with a passionate pursuit and that's what a hasid is so hasidic so hased is the loving kindness gevla is the form or the flow so in this today our reflection is going to be the underlying intention and motive in discipline is love so you can't have love and not discipline the scripture in fact teaches that if a man or woman does not discipline their children, they do not love them. And our Heavenly Father, He disciplines us, right? Have you ever been under discipline of the Lord? I have. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> I'd rather obey the first time and get it right. Wouldn't you? So let's do that together. We'll study that together tonight. So why do we measure our... Well, let's see. Why do we measure our behavior is the question. Establish standards and accept people to live up to them only because of love. Even judgment of the guilty is an expression of love. In other words, punishment is not vengeance. It's just another way to express love by cleansing anything antithetical to love. Tolerance of people should never be confused with tolerance of their behavior. When my children were young, I would tell them, the Bible says, if you love your children, you will discipline them. And sometimes that means a spanking. And uh, hi, Akila. Good evening. So sometimes that means a spanking. 
And today that means a spanking. So I'd have them bend over. I'd get something to swat their butt with a couple times. Oh, if they had more than three spankings their entire childhood, it was a lot. But the point is, is I wanted them to begin to understand the lesson that God loves us and he wants us to love them. And in love is also discipline. And that's what chesed of Gebuah. God's loving kindness also includes God's discipline. It's just another way to express love by cleansing anything antithetical to love. Tolerance of people should never be confused with tolerance of their behavior. On the contrary, love for people includes wanting them to be the best they can be, therefore helping them be aware of anything less than their perfect or complete behavior. Chesed beg gebuah is the love in the discipline. Awareness of this intrinsic love that underlies discipline and judgment, it is the recognition that your personal discipline and the discipline you expect of others is only an expression of love. It is the understanding that we have no right to judge others. Judge would mean to bring condemnation or wrath or, or judgment. We have a right only to love them. And that includes wanting the bet them to be their best. Now, as adults, one to another, I had a recent situation. I went to, um, actually it was Purim, at a rabbi's house uh, here in town. It wasn't Rabbi Libro, it was another rabbi that I know. And this rabbi, his um, during all of Purim, he began to get inebriated and had drunk a lot. And, uh, and then his children were jumping, his son was jumping off the rafters onto the couch from the stairs, at the top of the stairs. And the children were very... Um, disobedient to the father. He asked them to stop and they just kept doing it. So later the same man had asked me if I was going to come back for um, Erev Shabbat. And I said, you know, uh, are you going to get drunk this time? And he says, what do you mean? I said, well, you may not realize this, but you have a reputation for being a drunk and your children are out of, co are out of control. Um, yeah, I'm going to get to that, Jake. Jake brought up a really good point. Uh, <laughs> so so I confronted this brother in love because I do love and care about him. He's not a believer in Yeshua, but he is a believer in the Torah. And I did some research into the teachings of his own sect of Hasidic Judaism and found out that their Rebbe, Menachem Schneerson, had issued an edict back in the 60s that only four Lachayims were allowed at any event. And for Purim, where some of the sages say it's necessary to become inebriated to the point you can't tell the difference between uh, Haman and Mordecai, um, they said you can sacrifice one person in your group to do that because apparently there's developing a problem amongst this sect of Hasids of, of alcoholism. And so I reminded this brother, this friend of mine, and said, you know, even the Rebbe had did a teaching on this many years ago, only four Lahayams, which means only four drinks of wine, and that wasn't strong drink. And I said, you know, I, I corrected him in love. And he goes, well, are you mad at me? He's like, no, I'm not mad at you at all. I said, my Rebbe, Yeshua HaMashiach, he instructs me that if a brother offends me, I'm to go to him and confront him in love. And if he listens to me, I won my brother. And he says, well, you know, children, they are out of control, blah, blah, blah. I said, you're just making excuses. Your son was showing disrespect to you, and that was teaching everybody who was there to be disrespectful to you as well. You were showing disrespect to God and to the Rebbe and to all of us as guests because you were drunk, and that's not acceptable. Uh, and then a third principle that he violated was talking about money on the Sabbath. So that's a very key principle in Orthodox Judaism is you don't talk about money on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a day of rest. So in the process, I showed him love by correcting him, and then we remained friends. And we continue to talk, and we talk to this day. Um, my point is, that was my way of showing chesed begevuah to a man who's not even a believer in Jesus, Yeshua. So in that process, I showed him love, and then I continued to be his friend and didn't judge him. So I'm not here to judge you. I'm just here to correct. I'm just here to share an offense. And if you listen to me, wonderful. If you don't, well, then it's your loss. So that's a situation where I was in authority over him, I was actually in his home as a guest, technically under his authority. And so I share with him a situation, and I think he really listened to me. So why do I share that? Because I want you to realize that we have an opportunity to share this chesed, the begevuah, to others in our lives, whether they're in under authority of us at work, 
or in ministry or in other situations, we can show love to one another. In fact, part of the Wild Branch ministry, our principles of ministry, is what we call the covenant of, um, and it's slipping my mind entirely, <laughs> Uh, the covenant of, uh, I had it right in my head, where we follow Matthew 18, where we, we will talk to one another if we offend one another and bring it together and so that we can work things out. So, um, is the understanding that we have no right to judge others, but we have a right only to love them. And that includes wanting them to be at their best. Now, Jake, yeah, harmony. That's right. Thank you, Jacob. The covenant of harmony. <laughs> Jake's, uh, Jake's like a little bird on my shoulder. He helps me when I get stuck. <laughs> the covenant of harmony. Thank you. So, <clears throat> and uh, this principle co correlates with Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life, which I believe is rule number. Jake will tell me, I'm sure, because he has it memorized better than I do. Uh, uh, set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. That's rule number six. Yeah, Keila's laughing at me. Rule number six, set your house in order before you criticize the world. Um, and that's super important. You know, I seem to have heard another great rabbi teach on that subject. I believe that was Rabbi Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus our Messiah. And he was my Rebbe. He's my great rabbi that I, that I serve and I follow. And you do as well, if you're watching this. So... Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. This is uh, from the NIV version. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And Jesus goes on to, to talk about what Jake and I often talk about uh, together is the, uh, the board, you know, uh, the, the board and the, and the speck. Uh, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? We call it plank eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a huge plank in your eye? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Then Jesus says, do not give to dogs what is sacred, and do not throw your pearls before pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Fascinating. So Jesus, Yeshua himself, addressed this very specific principle uh, of chesed begevua. So I think we need to judge ourselves first. We need to examine our own lives. And though I corrected a friend of mine in a situation i waited until an appropriate time i didn't do it in front of other people um if you know who i'm talking about you'll probably never met him but the point is is i was able to show uh chesed begevua to uh, a friend of mine uh yeah so uh jake said he was also thinking of rule five do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them which is jordan peterson rule five and uh yeah, and I think that all goes along the same process. So, but I was able to correct a friend of mine that I had spent time building relationship and rapport with and talk to him and give him some tough encouragement and saying, here's a reputation you have in the community. And if you're wise, you'll pay attention and correct this. So how many times has anybody done that to you? How many times has anybody done it to me? In fact, it's one of the probably two or three things in most of Christendom of the church that we don't do. We don't show Matthew 18 love to one another. We judge each other. We gossip about each other and we bring condemnation. And in that process, we bring judgment onto ourselves. Now, Jake and I have had a lot of discussions and we'll continue to have that on that it's okay to judge because we're being discerning. People sometimes come to us as a group of men in our men's group to be judged, not condemned because it's not our responsibility to condemn someone. Uh, but to say you're not meeting up to the standard of your life. I had a friend recently, this uh, recent couple weeks ago, um, whom we I had a conversation with him, and him and his wife were in an argument and disagreement, and um, and I told him I said you're in the wrong. What you did was never acceptable and should never happen again. You were in the wrong. And then his wife, I told her, 
you were in the wrong. And I explained to her in the area that she was in the wrong. And I said, so let's cut this out. Let's stop doing this. Let's learn to love one another and to be honest and to take a break. If the, if the argument and the disagreement is getting to the point of being, of escalating, then somebody needs to call time out. And I said, in fact, right now, in the middle of this conversation with these people, I said, I'm calling time out and you're both in time out for two hours <laughs> until your amygdala calms down and you can come together and talk. And they did. And they took a break. And when they came back together, they were able to talk about what's going on. I said, focus on what you need to grow in, not what the other person needs to change. Focus on yourself first. Get the board out of your eye before you try to help your spouse to get the board out of their eye. And they did. And they came together. They came to agreement. And there was healing that flowed between the two of them. And, uh, and it was beautiful. It was really exciting. So... Um, so take that to heart. Let the Lord minister that to you. How many areas in our lives uh, can we show that chesed begevulah? So um, the, here's a question to ponder. Is there any hidden satisfaction in, in this failure? Uh, in someone else's failure, when we watch someone else fail? Yeah, sometimes we're judgmental and we like to see other people fail because that makes us feel like we're better at what we, who we are, what we're doing. Uh, is the only way... Is it only out of love for the other? And sometimes it's not. And we have to be honest with ourselves and with the Lord as we examine our own hearts. So before you criticize someone today or become critical or develop a critical attitude or a critical eye, interestingly enough, uh, get the board out of your own eye first. Take that before the Father and let him heal you. Is it only out of love for the other? So let's go ahead and close with the word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for this time together. We thank you for this point of reflection that brings us back to the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, the words of our Rebbe, Rebbe Yeshua HaMashiach, and help us to follow his teaching and his example and to absorb these principles, these sifarot, uh, into our lives. So, Father, we just pray that you would help us to reflect on things we need to change and grow in. Help us to winnow out to 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 begin the process to clean out the dross from our hearts so that you don't have to. <laughs> and we just thank you for that, Father. We thank you for this time together. We pray a blessing on this day. The beginning of the new day is at sunset. And we pray your blessing, Hashem Yeshua HaMashiach, on the lives of our friends, of our family, of our children, of our grandchildren and future great-grandchildren. Uh, we're praying for... Um, uh, Jake's, I want to pray for Jake's cousin, Craig. Uh, Craig is going in for gallbladder surgery uh, tomorrow morning. So, Father, we just pray a blessing over Craig tomorrow, that you would guide the doctor's hands, that his oxygen levels would remain strong and healthy, and that you would just, this would be a very smooth and simple and quick surgery, and that uh, Craig would come out of the surgery feeling fantastic because he's got something out of his body that was not working well. And when we just pray a blessing, you'd guide the doctor's hands and use this as an opportunity for, for Craig to receive grace from you and to trust you in a new way in his life. We thank you for that, Father. And we just, we just pray a blessing on him. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of Jesus, our Messiah, our Rebbe. Amen. So if you have a prayer request, if you have a need, send me a Facebook message like Jake did. Send me an email. Jake and I call and talk to each other almost every day. And so we just pray that you would, you just ask that you would just get in touch with us. Jake and I will pray for you. Akila, I talk to Akila every couple of days. Debbie and I pray together. So we'll bring it before the Father and we'll, we'll lift it up and see his kingdom come, Malchutzo, and his will be done in our lives here on earth as it is in heaven. So have a fantastic evening. I'm going to take a break for a minute, and then I'm going to do today's uh, counting of the old Americans. I got a day behind from not feeling well yesterday. So Lord bless you. Have a wonderful evening, and we'll talk to you soon.